Let us now return then to Romans. And for our text, we might choose verse 16, a well-known verse to us. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 will be our text, where we read the words of the Apostle Paul, written under the inspiration of the Spirit. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And particularly these words, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The title I'd like to give to our meditation uh, this morning is simply taken directly from the text, not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed of the gospel. There are two basic things that he said before we come to our text in the opening verses. The first one is that he presented his credentials to the Romans. And we would find that really in verses 1 to 7. And it's important for us to bear in mind that the Apostle Paul did not found the church that was based in Rome. How it came about, we cannot be certain. It could well be that there were some there on the day of Pentecost, and they heard the gospel there being proclaimed by Peter. And they brought the gospel back to Rome, where they had lived. And it's possible that the church began from the day of Pentecost. But Paul was didn't visit Rome before this. And he may have known one or two of the members of the church in Rome, but he was largely unknown unto them. But he longed to visit them. And in order to visit them, he wanted to introduce himself and his gospel that he proclaims. And thus, this is what we find here. This epistle, the epistle to the Romans, is basically the apostle Paul introducing himself and the gospel that he proclaims to the church in Rome. And in the first opening verses, he presents his credentials. He reminds them that he was a servant of Christ, he was an apostle, he was a preacher of the gospel, and he was a missionary, particularly to the Gentiles. He had a divine commission that he received the day he was converted on the road to Damascus, that he was to go forth and he was to preach the everlasting gospel. And the main part of his commission was that he was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He had a wonderful, fulsome commission. Peter, we believe, was the, principally the apostle to uh, the Jews. But that the task of evangelizing the Gentiles was given to the apostle Paul. And he notes he was a servant. He was literally a slave of the Lord Jesus. The great apostle Paul was happy to call himself a slave of Christ. And that's what we are, friends. If we are Christians, we belong to the Lord Jesus. He has bought us. He has bought us and purchased us by his precious blood. He gave his life in order that we might have life. And therefore, when we come in union with Christ, when we're savingly brought in union with him, when we are justified by faith, we are his slaves. And oh, friends, are you not happy to be a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ? Once you were a slave to sin and to Satan and to this evil world, and Jesus Christ, by his mighty grace and his wonderful power, has taken you from the kingdom of darkness, and he has freed you, and he has brought you into his kingdom to be a slave. What a pleasure! What an honor! What a glory to be under the headship of Christ. Who better could you serve? The Apostle Paul was happy to call himself a slave of the Lord Jesus. And he was made an apostle and a preacher. Oh, this was his great role. 
He didn't go about organizing social events. He didn't organize drama or singing workshops. He was taken up with opening his mouth and declaring Christ in all his fullness. And it did not matter who his audience was, whether it was kings or whether it was slaves in Caesar's household. He brought the gospel to them as a preacher. He stood there as a town crier. He wasn't there to negotiate with them. He was there to bring a message. He was an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God had given him a tongue and a mouth and a voice. And he was going to use it in order to preach his master. Well, the other thing that he highlights in these opening verses he not only presented his credentials, but he expressed his concern for the congregation, a congregation that largely he knew nothing about personally. And we will find that really from verses 8 to 15. The Apostle Paul is often portrayed wrongly as a hard-headed theologian. And all that he was concerned about was election and predestination and reprobation. But no, the Apostle Paul was one who loved individuals, who loved people. And he loved them that much that he was prepared to tell them the truth as it is in Jesus. And he expressed his concern for the congregation. He was thankful for them. He prayed for them. He loved them. Look at verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. The apostle Paul had much to give. He was an apostle. But he also recognized that although he had much to give, the people of Rome had much to give him. It was to be mutually beneficial. And this is very often the way it is between a congregation and the minister. He is there to benefit them, but they are there also to benefit him. So that in some sense they both grow, the congregation and the minister. This is the way it was for the Apostle Paul. And he had a debt to them. What verse 13 say? Now I would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also even as among the other Gentiles. I'm a debtor. He has a debt to fulfill. He's going back to the days of the Damascus Road experience. He remembers seeing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He remembers the words of Christ. He recognized he has been given this commission. And this is a great debt that he owes to the Gentiles. He must preach the gospel to them also. The church is well established. The church in some sense is known throughout the known world, but he has a debt and he's going to honor it. He's going to fulfill it. He's going to go forth and to preach the gospel to them also. And he was eager for it, eager. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. As you know, the Apostle Paul had been around almost the, the whole of the known world up until this point. And everywhere he went, he brought the gospel. And now he's eager to go to what we might say virgin territory. No other apostle had been there. The gospel was there, yes, but no other apostle had been there. And he wanted to go. He was eager, eager to go out and to preach the gospel. And friends, this is, is something that should characterize the gospel minister. Why would you go to a pulpit if you're not going to proclaim Christ? 
Many pulpits today, what do we have? They'll talk about politics. They'll talk about green issues. They'll talk about all kinds of things. They'll talk about man's wisdom and man's philosophy. Away with it. We are here to preach the gospel. And if people are tired of it, then so be it. We have a mandate to preach the everlasting gospel and the everlasting gospel only. And what's true of the gospel minister, friends, is true of the private Christian. Oh, do we not love the gospel? Do we not love the God of the gospel? Do we not delight in the Savior when we look at the cross? Do you ever look at the cross in your mind? Do you ever see it there, friends? The Lord Jesus on the cross with his crown of thorns and his hands and feet pouring blood out of them. And you see the spear being pushed into his side and you hear the agonies of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this, in some sense, stirs you up, does it not? Does it not, in some sense, terrify you when you see the wrath of God being poured out upon his only begotten Son? And then, when you think of that, and you visualize it in your mind, do you not see the love of God? Do you not see the love of the Savior who was prepared to undergo all of this? No wonder the Apostle Paul could go nowhere but preach the gospel. He wasn't going to get involved in politics. He wasn't going to get involved in good causes. He had the ultimate cause. And that ultimate cause filled his mind and he opened his mouth. Out of the heart, the Bible says, the mouth speaketh. And you'll know what's in the, the minister's heart when he comes to the pulpit. You'll know it. And if you're under a ministry where a minister doesn't talk about the gospel or preach the gospel, you can be sure he's ignorant of the gospel because it's out of the heart the mouth speaketh. Well, he had a deep concern for them. And friends, as we get to our text, this, this concern is manifested in the fact that he had confidence in the gospel. And that's what we want to look at today. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. He was introducing himself. He had a love for them. But he had a confidence in the gospel. And friends, you might say it was this confidence in the gospel that motivated him. He had a commission, true. And the commission itself should motivate him. But many people might have a commission and they might have no confidence in it. The Lord Jesus Christ gave him a commission. To preach. And he was not ashamed of the sum and the substance of that message. Well, four things we might say about this confidence that he had in the gospel. First of all, we have the origin. The origin of the gospel, it is, according to our text, the gospel of Christ. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Go to verse 1. What do we find? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated, separated unto the gospel of God. Verse 9. What do we find? For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. We are to derive from these verses, friends, that the gospel is something that comes from heaven. Very often when we seek to present the gospel, we're, we're told, this is your opinion. No. 
I'm not here declaring my opinion. This is a message from heaven. This is God speaking. This is the great God who made all things. This is God who made you. This is God who is reading your mind at this moment. This is God who is speaking to you through the gospel. He is telling you this. He is telling you this clearly and plainly. This is my word from heaven. The minister is not declaring something that has come from the Free Church of Scotland or any other church. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes with the full authority of the God of heaven. And friends, this should cause us then to sit up and to stir ourselves. We are hearing what God would have us to hear. This is what God has brought in his word. It is concerning the gospel. And it comes with all the authority of almighty God. It's a gospel that was promised in the Old Testament, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, verse 2. The Old Testament, we might sum it up by saying, it is God preparing the world for his Son. It is God in all providence, working out a salvation in order, in the fullness of time, to bring forth his Son to this world. It was, in some sense, a stage. And God was ordering and directing every single thing that ever happened in the world unto that point when it was proper and fit that the Son of God should appear. That's what the Old Testament is. It is God preparing for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first gospel promise we get is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Let us quote it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. And thou shalt bruise his heel. We want to note one or two things from that text. And I'm not ashamed if I'm going to be repeating myself here. But we need to hear this. And we need to hear it and delight in it. This gospel promise is the first gospel promise. And that promise was ultimately fulfilled when Christ came and at that great battle on the cross, there Satan in some sense bruised the heel of the Lord Jesus. But Christ bruised his head so that he received a fatal blow. That's what happened on the cross. And that promise was fulfilled and is being fulfilled. But I want you to note, friends, something about this promise. Who was it addressed to? Yes, our first parents were there, Adam and Eve, they were there. But friends, this gospel promise was first and foremost addressed to the evil one. It was to Satan himself. It was to the serpent. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Satan had entered into a relationship with our first parents. He thought he had broken up the relationship that our parents had with their creator. And to some extent he did. But God said, it's all going to change. I'm going to put enmity between thee and the seed of the woman. And God was going to do something. God was going to act. And in Christ, he truly did act. But notice, friends, notice this. Here, the gospel was proclaimed to Satan, who could never be saved. Never. There was no hope for redemption for him. Yet, God proclaimed the gospel to him. There are some 
ministers of the gospel who are ashamed of the gospel. They're afraid to proclaim it. They'll talk about Christ, but they will not hold forth Christ, and they will not tell people to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because to them, the gospel's only for the elect. Here is someone who was never the elect, and never will be the elect, yet God proclaimed the gospel to him. Let us be one's friends who will proclaim Christ in all his fullness, and let us freely um, freely offer him to all, that all might realize that if they will but come, they will be saved, no matter the background, no matter their present condition. If they will but come to the Lord Jesus, they shall be saved. The gospel has come from God. Secondly then, we have the operation of the gospel. Our text tells us it is the power of God, for it is the power of God. In creation, as Paul goes on to speak about this, in creation we see something of the power of God. And creation and providence and our conscience are all telling us that the God of the Bible is real. We don't need to prove the existence of God. God has already given every single human being enough knowledge to know that the God of the Bible is real and he exists. So much so that everyone is without excuse. And if someone says they're an unbeliever, they have no excuse for their unbelief. None whatsoever. God has revealed his power, his Godhead, in, the, in creation. So if there's anyone here who's an unbeliever, you have no excuse for your unbelief. None whatsoever. But here he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God. It is God's power. It's not only God's message. It is God's power. And God's power is exercised in the gospel. You are asked, friends, in the gospel to repent and believe. Now, if you're really thinking at all, you know that you cannot repent and you cannot believe left to yourself. You know that. And anyone who's truly serious about the claims of Christ will come to this point in, in their understanding. The gospel requires me to repent and the gospel requires me to believe, but I cannot do that in of myself. But the gospel comes with the power of God. It is the power of God. And when the gospel call comes, when it is effectual, it's not just when you hear a preacher's voice, but when it comes with the effectual power of the Holy Spirit, then, friends, the gospel is the power of God. The gospel changes the individual. The person who was unwilling becomes willing in the day of his power. Because the gospel alone is the power of God unto salvation. You know, the preacher must, in some sense, seek to persuade individuals. And he will use all the word of God. He will preach about heaven. And he will preach about hell. He will seek to woo sinners in by the glories and the majesty and the peacefulness and the blessedness of heaven. And tell all... 
That in Christ all of this is yours. In Christ it's yours. And for those maybe who are stubborn or who are hard-hearted, he might try to tell them about the horrors of hell. Who can possibly describe the horrors of hell? To be separated from the gracious presence of God for all eternity. To suffer. To have that conscience gnawing away at you morning, noon and night. When you think about the lost opportunities that you have forsaken. And now you're perishing and there's no hope. No hope. It will never change. You cannot mitigate if you're in hell. Never, never. It's on and on and on. And the preacher will have, will try to tell people of the horrors of it. Well, no matter how persuasive the preacher is, the gospel is a power of God and it comes with God's power. And in the gospel, God reveals his power. You see, this is something only God could do. You know, some people get concerned about the eternal future. And they're fearful about meeting God. And they, they take a, a shake to themselves. And they start to do certain things in the hope that somehow God will accept them. They'll try to reform their lives. They'll become religious or become charitable or whatever. And they'll try to turn over a new leaf. And all of these things are good to a certain extent. But all of these things are but filthy rags in the sight of God. You see the power of God is found in the gospel. It tells you to look away from yourself. And to look to another. Who's that other? It is Jesus Christ. The operation of the gospel. It is the power of God. Well, maybe thirdly from our text, we might notice something else about the gospel. We have the outcome of the gospel. We have the outcome. What does it say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Here Paul is talking really first hand. He is in some sense given his testimony in a very concise form here. He knows the power of the gospel. Why does he know it? He knows it because his life has changed. That's why. You know, that moment when he was converted, before he had been kicking against the pricks, his conscience was troubled, and maybe he didn't know what was happening. But that time when he was converted, he knew that his life had been transformed. It had been changed. Once he was a religious man, a devout religious man, a self-religious man, self-righteous religious man. That's what he was. But when he met Christ, when he bowed before him, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He was transformed. He began to see himself really what he was. He knew that he was a covetous individual. He knew he was a sinner, rotten sinner. And all his works and all his religion, what was it? It was but self-righteousness. And he knew that he needed the Savior. And to salvation. It transforms lives. Congregation. Has your life been transformed? Or have you simply just added something to your life? You have to examine your own life. You know, Christianity is not just something you take up. It's not like joining a club. It's a revolution. It's the life of God coming in to the soul. And when the life of God comes in, it manifests itself. It transforms. It changes lives. Whose life was changed like the Apostle Paul? Once he was a persecutor of the church. Then he became a preacher. A 
preacher of the very gospel that he sought to annihilate. Such was his hatred. Sadly today, friends, in the professing Christian church, we're ashamed of the gospel. Lives are not being transformed. You can be a Christian, a professing Christian, and take all your garbage with you and carry on. You can be unclean. You can be drunk. You can be a swearer. You can be an idle busybody. You can be a gossip. You can be many things and still be a respectable Christian. That's not the Christian of the Bible. That's not what the gospel does. It's unto salvation. And we know we're not perfect. Nothing like it. But we know there's been a transformation. We know there has been a change. We know that the old desires have gone. And yes, we know we have to fight against them. Because the old man is not completely dead. And very often the old nature will resurrect itself. But ultimately, friends... Christianity, real Christianity, is salvation. It is deliverance. We are broken free. We've been broken free from the fetters of sin. And we live a new life. And many people today are ashamed of the new life. It's a very interesting verse I've got here that I'm going to quote and again, we, we would note that this verse, Jesus said what I'm about to quote to his disciples. He did not say this generally. He did not say this to multitudes. He said it to his disciples. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of the, his Father and the holy angels. Disciples, who therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words? You know, there are many people who are not ashamed of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, he's a wonderful example. His teaching is wonderful. And if we adopted the teaching of the Lord Jesus, why, our lives would be transformed and our society would be transformed. But... Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words. How many love the Lord Jesus but they don't love his words? They don't love all of his words. They don't love the words that tell us to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and to follow him. They love, if you like, the words of forgiveness. But they do not love the words of discipleship. Well, we are to know, friends, that the outcome of the gospel, true-hearted gospel, is salvation. It is to be delivered. It is to be set free. Well, finally... And fourthly, we would notice the outreach of the gospel. What does our text say? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. All mankind is lost and perishing. The Jew he might have thought that he was a special case. 
And in some sense, he was a special case because God had been gracious to the Jews and he had given the Jews the scriptures, the covenants, divine worship, while he had left the Gentiles to perish in their idolatry and unbelief. The Jews were highly favored for salvation was, was to come from the Jews. But the Apostle Paul is telling them here that the gospel is just as relevant for the Jews as it is to the Greek. The Greek here simply just means the Gentiles, the non-Jews. The non and this may well have an application for ourselves. Most of us here would probably be regarded as churchgoers and we would have a, a Christian upbringing. We might in some sense be in, in some way the same as the Jews. Wonderful privileges. Being brought to the house of God under the means of grace. Christian parents. A Christian background. And somehow we might think, well, the gospel, yes, it's fine. It's fine for those out there. It's fine for the drunkard. It's fine for the harlot. It's fine for the unclean person. It's fine for the robber. And it's fine for those who are never in the house of God. But that's not what the gospel says. It's for all. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. The Greeks would regard themselves as the highly educated, the cultured of the world of that day. And the barbarians would be the, those who didn't experience the, the, the culture of the Greeks. The unwise. It's for all. That's the outreach of the gospel. It's for every single one of us. And I want to ask you, friends, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Because that is the sum and the substance of the gospel. It is a person. You are to know him. Whom to know is life everlasting. Whether we are church goer or a non-church goer. We are to know him. Because the gospel is for every single one of us without exception. And if we don't have Christ as Lord and Savior, we're facing a lost eternity. And blessed be God, this is the day of salvation. This is the time when in some real sense, the claims of Christ have been impressed upon you. And you are to close in with Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Timothy. We love Timothy. But Timothy was inclined to be a wee bit timid. And the Apostle Paul had to stir him up. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, here we have some exhortation to Timothy who was at this time pastoring the troublesome uh, church at Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul says to him, For which cause... I also suffer these things. The Apostle Paul was suffering because of the gospel. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Mm -hmm. Poor Timothy was inclined to be ashamed, ashamed of the Apostle Paul and his imprisonments and all his trials. He was inclined to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul tells him, no, you're not to be ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Why? Because I have committed my soul unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Christian, have you got this assurance? Have you got this assurance? Why then are you ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ? Should you not delight in him? That one who has saved you and who will take you to glory? Let us not be ashamed then. Others may be. Not us. 
By the grace of God, we will not be ashamed. We will delight in the gospel because we delight in the author of the gospel. In the very sum and the substance of the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ. Let us therefore go from the service and let us be stirred up. Let us repent of the times when we have been ashamed of him. And who hasn't? Who hasn't? That verse that I quoted from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 is a paraphrase or part of a paraphrase. In a former church, we used to sing a paraphrase. And the opening verse of paraphrase 54 is, paraphrase 54 is translated, is a translation of that verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, which reads, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause, maintain the glory of the cross and honor all his laws. Can you say amen to that? The Apostle Paul could. He was not ashamed of the gospel, nor of his Savior. Amen. May God bless his word to us.